on GB News. Hey, welcome along on tonight's Mark Stein Show. For the first year, they inflated the COVID death numbers. For the second year, they deflated the vaccine side effect numbers. What's up with that? And just a month into the new war, who's winning this thing? Plus, the most vital part of the show, all the more important when we live in the constant swirl of a blizzard of lies, your comments and questions, pure, unsullied and uncensored. Do send them along by email, uh, gbviews at gbnews.uk, or you can tweet me at gbnews. But first, as always, the news with Tamsin Roberts. Mark, thank you. Good evening from the GB Newsroom. The tax burden is set to hit its highest level since the 1940s, despite moves by the Chancellor to cut taxes. Rishi Sunak presented his spring statement on the same day inflation reached a 30-year high. Fuel duty has been cut by five pence a litre until March next year. VAT is also being scrapped on energy-saving measures such as solar panels, heat pumps and insulation. And the threshold for paying national insurance will increase by £3,000 from July, meaning employees will save around £330 a year. Last year, I told the House I would cut taxes for hard-working families, but I would do so in a responsible and sustainable way. And today, I am delivering on that promise. The shadow Chancellor, Rachel Reeve, says the announcements will make the rising costs of living worse, not better. Chancellor has failed to appreciate the scale of the challenge that we face. And yet again, he is making the wrong choices for our country. Ukraine has accused Russia of seizing 15 rescue workers and drivers from a humanitarian convoy trying to bring supplies into the besieged port city of Mariupol. New release drone footage shows the extent of destruction across the city following weeks of heavy shelling. President Volodymyr Zelensky says 100,000 civilians remain trapped there without food, water or medicine. Meanwhile, top Kremlin official Anatoly Chubai has apparently quit in protest over the war in Ukraine and has reportedly left Russia. The special envoy was one of the architects of the post-Soviet economic reforms. Jamaica's prime minister says he intends to fulfil his country's ambition to become independent. Just a warning, the video we're about to show you contains flashing images. The Duke and Duchess of Cambridge had an official meeting with Andrew Holness as part of their tour of the Caribbean, marking the Queen's Platinum Jubilee. He told them their presence provided an excellent opportunity to address unresolved issues. The wife of Julian Assange has made an emotional speech to well-wishers outside Belmarsh Prison after marrying the imprisoned WikiLeaks founder. Six guests were allowed at the ceremony, including Assange's two brothers and his father, John. He continues to fight extradition to the United States over the alleged leaking of national security information. Stella Morris fought back tears as she told the crowd she was very happy but very sad. TV online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now, though, let's head back to Mark. As I think many of us grasp, we're coming to the end of an era, the American moment. America is the broke, brokey, brokiest entity in the history of brokenness. Its national government has to pay back $30 trillion just to get back to having nothing in its pocket. No one in human history has ever done that before. The only question is whether the end of the American moment is even bigger than that. If you ask uh, worldly Parisians, they will say that the whole ghastly two centuries of Anglo-American dominance since the Battle of Trafalgar is coming to an end and good riddance. And if you ask the Chinese, they'll say that half a millennium of perverse Euro-American dominance is coming to an end and the world is being reoriented to the Orient. 
and to its rightful and far superior civilization. In other words, Western civilization is sliding off a cliff, and most citizens of Western nations aren't even aware of that, which is why we'll be talking about misgendering some tweeters' pronouns when Peking pulls off its EMP attack or the Mueller's nucus. All these factors are in play to one degree or another in Ukraine in what appears on the surface to be an old-fashioned war of old-fashioned brutality. Set aside the Zoom call cool of Zelensky, I know from my mailbag that he grates on many of you. Just the figure-hugging T-shirt so that his nipples enter the room six inches ahead of him like an advanced security team. Uh, so that's without getting into his banning of pro-Russian political parties and all the stuff about the neo-Nazi militias. Uh, but when I was in Ukraine last week, I nevertheless thought, oh, yeah, this is what countries used to be like. Whatever you make of the war, Ukraine is very Ukrainian, with the exception of its long-settled Hungarian minority, the only non-Ukrainian I met last week was an Armenian lady working for a German company. Oddly enough, she was also the only person I met who didn't think Ukraine would win, and anyway, even if it did, all the infrastructure would be destroyed, so there'd be nothing left anyway. Token diversity and token fatalism, nihilism, pessimism, all in one comely Armenian package. Other than that, I found Ukraine full of Ukrainians, behaving very Ukrainianly. It reminded me of my childhood when Ireland was very Irish and Belgium was very Belgian. And now when you go to Dublin or Brussels, Stockholm or Boston, Vancouver or Cologne, they're all the same. Your Uber driver, your Starbucks barista, your kebab shaver all seem to have come from somewhere else. Diversity has led to a deadly, dreary homogeneity and indeed, the principal diversity now is between the rulers and the ruled. For all their ancient roots in the old sod, fellas like Justin Trudeau and Emmanuel Macron and Jens Stoltenberg and Ursula von der Leyen seem more like a race apart, with more in common with each other than with the compatriots they supposedly represent. I can't say I ever really subscribe to David Icke's theories about shape-shifting space lizards from the star system Alpha Centauri, but when you watch these fellows jetting hither and yon, making grand plans for net zero and digital identity, and all but oblivious to the little folk 30,000 feet below them, you can't help feeling that if the world was being run by shape-shifting space lizards, this is pretty much what they'd be doing, isn't it? I mean, it's hard to get shape-shifting space lizards to be interested in all the puny parochial concerns of the little people, such as, uh, as we've just seen with today's pseudo-budget, the worst inflation in 40 years, the biggest drop in standards of living in 70 years, and the highest taxes in 80 years. That's all too footling for a space lizard ruling class. And more to the point, as we've seen these last two weird and very creepy years, Faced with a supposedly unprecedented crisis, they all do exactly the same thing. The entire Western world, with the exceptions of Sweden and Florida. And even though it's rubbish and does more harm than the actual virus it's supposed to be combating, they keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over. And they think the same on all kinds of issues. Both the leader of Her Britannic Majesty's loyal opposition and Joe Biden's nominee for the U.S. Supreme Court are unable to say what a woman is. That's not a British or American cultural particular, but something that just seems to have taken hold throughout the world's ruling class. The nation-state, which has been the organizing principle of the functioning world since the Peace of Westphalia nearly 400 years ago, is in steep decline. And one-size-fits-all COVID policy 
is a terrible preview of the future. Let me know what you think. GBviews at gbnews.uk. You can tweet me at gbnews. Alexandra Marshall edits the Australian end of The Spectator, and we are always happy to see her. Alexandra, you, you posited uh, the other day a choice between uh, global, globalism and tribalism. And you put in a good word for the latter, which not many people do these days. I'm not sure if it's a good word, more of a recognition of reality, and that's that you can't change human nature as much as the globalists would like us to believe. And so my piece was more about understanding the reality of human behavior and how civilizations rise and fall and what damage a philosophy like globalism can do by trying to constrain our natural instincts. Mm. I, I, what, what struck me uh, in your piece, uh, particularly today after uh, uh, the Prime Minister of Jamaica was rather rude to the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge about the future of the Jamaican monarchy, uh, but you actually go and put in a good word for the British Empire. I mean, wait, 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 don't pull the plug on her just yet. She, she argues her case very well. And, and you said that one of, the, one of its uh, strokes of genius was not to impose a one-size-fits-all on the entire planet. So when they were on Pacific Islands, they looked at how people lived and, uh, and, and recognized that. When they were on the Indian subcontinent, they acknowledged what Indian culture and Indian tradition, tradition was. And that's not, and for all the criticism they get, uh, there's far more sort of cultural arrogance in our present globalist ruling class, isn't there? Well, the old empire, the old British empire, really cracked how to create and spread empires throughout the world. So whereas most empires like the USSR have to struggle to keep countries under their control, what the British empire did, which was different to the others, was it raised new colonies mm. in faraway land and then they matured into their own distinct countries and a lot of them were then voting themselves into independence. Now that is a successful empire building regime where you end up with stable nations at the end of it. And full disclosure, I am an ambassador for the Australian constitutional monarchy, but I do uh, admire at least the success in building stable empires rather than leaving everything an absolute mess. The UK did it better than, I'd say, most other empire builders around the world, which tended to leave more like rubble in their wake. Yeah, I didn't realise you were with the uh, Australians for constitutional monarchy. We should send you to uh, slap that Jamaican uh, prime minister around the cheeks and uh, talk some sense into him. Um, but but it is, it is amazing. I can't think of any time uh, where... Uh, the the, the so-called globalist guys who are kind of uh, seem disconnected from the facts on the ground. And, the, and there is also a contempt. Now, even in the age of empires, people recognize that national sovereignty was the basis of global order. So whether you're talking about the British Empire or the French Empire or the Germans or, or whoever, the idea that uh, that there are sovereign entities who are entitled to determine their own path was recognized. And now it's like a bunch of guys get together and make plans for the rest of us. It's the old socialist world order idea where they want to have a bureaucracy of unelected officials deciding for nations what mm. they can and can't do. And it's not really about not having sovereignty or an independent country anymore. It's about a new country, a country without borders, run by bureaucrats, where they basically, it's an old school world domination, James Bond style plot. And we're seeing it mm. rebranded mm. as globalism, but it's the same old disaster and you can't do it. As I said out of my piece, countries need their identities. They need to solve problems their own ways. You can't have uniform approaches to everything for humanity. It doesn't work. And it's falling apart rapidly and catastrophically because we had a shadow of it in the UN and its predecessor, the League of Nations, try it in a softer form, and it causes problems there. Mm. But in a truly international mm. socialist regime, you get really big problems like a global war. 
Now, when you mention the whole James Bond thing, uh, Ian Fleming, in in literary terms, gets gets mocked because people think John le Carre and the spy who came in from the cold is all more realistic. But, you know, the fellows at Davos believe are actually uh, straight out of any Bond film. They're holding the Spectre board meeting. Uh, they don't yet have a hollowed out volcano. They may have a hollowed out volcano and it's just we don't know where it is yet. But they're holding it at the top of a Swiss Alp, which is the next best thing. And they're talking about the great reset and they're talking about the great narratives. And for the most part, with the uh, with the exception of the prime ministers who jet in, these are all completely unelected people. These are powerful businessmen. They are layabout Saudi princes. And yet they all seem to assume in their every utterance that they have the right to make these plans. Are we, in a sense, moving... Uh, into a post-democratic age? Well, that's what they hoped would happen. But as was predicted mm. and always the case, these business people and bureaucrats thought they could control the global narrative and what countries would do. And of course, as soon as they created this environment for the destruction of civilization, because they wanted to profit from basically the scraps and the ash and the, uh, and the mm. rubble, but they lost control of Russia immediately and they're about to lose control of China. Mm. And so their little bureaucracy and world mm. domination plans count for nothing. And all the paper and all the speeches they gave are meaningless when empires start rising and falling. And we have Russia and China who want to replace the US and they will pay absolutely no attention to anything they said or did at Davos. And Davos is about to realize that they have no real power and they never did. They only had power over democracies mm. while democracies cared what Davos thought. They actually don't have real ge uh, geographical power over anybody once a war starts to kick off. And that's what people did not expect to happen with Davos. They thought the Bond villain thing would play mm. out, but um, I predicted it would end in chaos and it, it's already started to fall apart. You saw them uh, disparaging Putin straight away. They're like, oh, he wasn't part of our world forum, but he was, he was there and China's yeah. still opening conventions. Yeah, it's temporary and it won't yeah. last. So you're, you're saying that uh, Russia and China behave like conventional imperialist nations advancing their interests. And we in the West have somehow uh, got seduced into thinking we're beyond all that. And, and, uh, and this super powerful elite making plans is somehow a substitute for hard power, which is actually what China and Russia are exercising. Yes, and I might point out that the West immediately realized their mistake. Whether they've cognitively realized it or not, they're already acting that way. Where we've started, for example, in Australia, we've got AUKUS, a new trilateral agreement. We have already started renewing mm. the military uh, bonds of our nations because we've realized we need real power, not bureaucratic, you know, anointed power from some business autocrats. We actually need real nation power if we're to survive the rise and jostling of China and Russia. Yeah, that's another lesson from Ukraine, that you, you actually have to be able to fight back on the ground in the way this uh, new world is uh, shaping out. Well, it, it, it was a great, uh, it's, a, it's a great insight, Alexandra, into our times, and, uh, and I appreciate it. Uh, very few people want to live in reality, and so they don't like it when we can't all be fluffy bunnies and talk about net zero as if that uh, actually ought to be our priority. So it's important to have people uh, who keep an eye on the underlying realities of these things. We always thank you for coming on with us, Alexandra, and hope to see you again soon. Thank you very much, Alexandra Marshall. She's doing a great job with the Aussie Spectator. And as I always say, uh, she did a much better job than those layabouts at the London end are. Uh, it's very sound, the Aussie Spectator. Uh, when we return, we'll get your thoughts and we'll talk about those grim COVID vaccine side effects that the rest of the media don't seem in the least bit interested. In. Don't touch that dial, we're coming right back.
GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. It's basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes, big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from 6 to half past 9 on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. I'm, I'm Mark. What's, what's your name? I'm Garrett. Uh, do, you, do you live uh, here in town? I live in Kharkiv. In where? Kharkiv. Kharkiv. Okay. Kharkiv, yeah. So when did you leave Kharkiv? Uh, five days ago. What was it like in Kharkiv five days ago? This is hell. It's hell. Town? Yeah. Uh, a lot of people. It's hell. Yeah. It's just a, a living hell. Yeah. No, take your take your time. You're, it's very upsetting for you. Yes, of course. My father don't uh, phone me two yeah. two weeks. Do you think the Ukrainians are winning this war? I know Ukraine win. Yeah. I know this. Yeah. Uh, Look at these people, these no. children, yeah? Yeah, these, these, these are Ukrainians who are free Ukrainians. Yeah. They don't want to be Russian slaves. No. 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 Well, I, I wish all the best for your, for your family, Karen. Thank you, thank you very much for talking to us. And uh, I'm sorry you've had to leave your town uh, and you've been here five days and I hope you'll be able to go back to your town very, very soon. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Uh, one of many Ukrainians I met last week. More on the war a little later. But let's get to your uh, comments about uh, diversity. Uh, I mean, basically, my point is diversity in Western cities leads to stultifying homogeneity. Phil says, I can't think of two global cities that feel similar. Well, Phil... I, I think you can go to almost any city in uh, Western Europe and compared to the way they were uh, 30, 40, 50 years ago, they're all a lot more similar. They all got the same, sometimes they got the same uh, multinational chains, the Starbucks and all that, and sometimes they've just got local variants, pizza kebab. I think it's in uh, Finland they call it pizza kebab and in Sweden they call it kebab pizza. But it's still pretty bad pizza. Uh, and barely passable uh, kebab. Um, Brian, and one of the things actually, when I, I went into Ukraine via Hungary, and uh, one of the things I like about Hungary is uh, because Mr. Orban is famously antipathetic to immigrants, uh, although he's taken in a lot of Ukrainians, 300,000, but when you're in Budapest, uh, you'll be checked in by a, a Hungarian hotel clerk, you'll be served 
by an Hungarian waitress. You'll be driven around by Hungarian cab drivers. Once upon a time, that was the natural way of things. Brian says it's also ruining our high streets. Uh, and Charlie says, uh, I'll make an Irish point on that, actually. I don't even see the point. We're celebrating the centenary of the Irish Free State. I don't even see the point of uh, unionists and uh, Republicans, uh, nationalists and loyalists, Protestants and Catholics, because oddly enough, uh, even a great city like Dublin or Belfast is now the same. You'll be, you've got more chance of being served by a Ukrainian barista in a, an Irish Starbucks than an Irish barista. Charlie says cities become the same when the people in them become the same. Cities all over the world now have the same mix of cultures, ethnicities, religions due to immigration. Places are losing their identity. The stultifying homogeneity of a diversity. Have you had your fourth booster yet? You know what they say. Sure, you'll still get the COVID, but don't worry, it'll be much milder. You won't be going into the ICU. Uh, there doesn't seem to be a lot of science behind that assertion. And there's mounting evidence to the contrary. A Polish study has found that mRNA vaccines may be damaging brain cells and immune systems. I talked a couple of weeks ago that they, they're causing uh, an uptick in chill brains. Chill brains you can probably handle. Uh, the death of your brain cells and the collapse of your immune system is slightly worse news than chill brains. Meanwhile, a German study of all-cause mortality has found that since the vaccinations got going, young and middle-aged persons are dying in larger numbers. Dr. Guy Hatcher has been writing about this at the Conservative Woman website for some time. And he joins us now from New Zealand. Guy, uh, the big takeaway from this, which I think is quite extraordinary, is that in 2020, when the COVID started raging, it didn't actually cause excess mortality uh, that year because... Uh, most of the people who died were over the average uh, a life expectancy in countries like the UK. So, for example, the average age of COVID death was 82.5 years or whatever it was. Uh, then they start vaccinating everybody and suddenly we have a huge uptick in deaths of the middle-aged and the young, and we're getting used to like celebrity, there's a spate of celebrity 52-year-olds, I notice, having fatal heart attacks. Something odd is going on, is it not? Absolutely it is. Um, we, uh, the paper yesterday uh, here at New Zealand Herald, greetings from the Hobbit Kingdom, Mark, the um, had a headline, most COVID patients in the Omicron outbreak are vaccinated, but that is no reason to doubt vaccine benefits. And they also ran an article saying yeah. that the huge uptick in cardiac events, they dubbed it the warn effect. They said uh, middle-aged men are getting anxiety because they think they may be similar to Shane Warne and that they're having heart attacks because of anxiety. That's uh, what now, happens when the government... Is, is that, actually, is that yeah. actually true? Are, are people seriously arguing that Shane Warne died of anxiety, uh, who, who was a gr brilliant uh, cricketer, and I regret that I'll never actually see him do some of those incredible things he did in the 90s. But people are actually arguing now that this is completely, this is some sort of anxiety, general anxiety that he died of. Uh, uh, people are doing anything uh, but admit that uh, something has gone terribly wrong. If, if our government here, for example, was to admit that uh, there was, there had been a, a wrong turn, you know, we've had two years of saturation mm. advertising. Mm. You can't turn on the television or go to social media without being told that mRNA vaccines are completely safe and effective. And people have become brainwashed, and the government has curated this. They paid for it. They paid the media 
And now they're faced with the fact that it actually doesn't work. Uh, now we actually have COVID. Mm. We've had COVID free in New Zealand for two years. Now we have COVID. The vaccinated and the unvaccinated are uh, getting it about equally as far as the relative population numbers are concerned. So it would be political suicide for Ardern to admit for two years that they had been pulling the wool over our eyes. And th there's no doubt that that happened absolutely deliberately. The, the government uh, swept the side effects under the carpet. We had 2,000 excess deaths in our very small country uh, s mm. during the time that the vaccine was rolled out. And that's yeah, and uh, they've been that was uh, yeah that's Go ahead. and that's very significant as you say in a population the size of New Zealand you can see similar things I think in in the uh, in, in the in the most totally vaccinated communities on Earth in in Gibraltar for example and in Israel they're still saying though like the United States for example is still saying you're going to get need to get the fourth booster right now is there actually any scientific justification for giving anybody another shot of this stuff well we've known for a long time that every time you take one of these injections the immune system gets suppressed in fact my best friend uh, that I went to university with died from immune suppression uh, it, it's mm. um, it's been known from, um, there was a paper published, for example, in May uh, 2021, analyzing this issue. And now we know a lot more than that. So uh, why is this happening? Well, pharmaceutical and biotech companies are really directly plumbed into governments. They're plumbed into medicines regulators. There's this international coalition of medicines regulatory authorities. Uh, UK is a member, New Zealand is a member. And that's a direct line into pharmaceutical propaganda and distortion of evidence. And this is dr driving government opinion. I, I, Jacinda Ardern has famously said, the government should be your only source of information. Well, her only source of information are pharmaceutical companies. And uh, that, it's a... Uh, you know, I don't like to w use the word uh, conspiracy, but it's a coalition of uh, information systems, me mainstream media systems, governments and biotech companies who are ideologically committed to a biotechnology future. And that's a really dangerous future. We're, um, well, what, uh, you know, we're facing a different kind of war altogether. We're facing a, right. a, a total right. war, a total biological war. Why do you think, uh, in the normal course of events, uh, there should be room for a diversity of opinion of this? Now, you've, you've written about, uh, for example, these German and Polish studies. These are not uh, countries that we think of as fringe countries full of kooks who've cooked this thing up. Why do they not get more play? It, why two years in uh, is the media still so invested in the official narrative and only that? There's a lot of um, there's a lot of money riding on it. I think you know biotechnology is seen as the future, and uh, that runs through the whole um, political and economic system that we have. And if, if, this, uh, if it was to get out, for example, uh, and be accepted, which it should be, that the disease was caused by, it was created in a lab, and the vaccine is created mm. in a lab, people would start to realize that we're facing something uh, that we've never faced before, which is indiscriminate war, you know, bio biotech war. Is, is a kind of mm. war. It's, it's got the psychology of the serial killer. Any victim will do, friend or foe, and the more the merrier, because these diseases, these pathogens, do not distinguish between people and countries. This is a, a frightening mm. prospect where, and it has to be stopped, but stopping that would change a whole system 
which is predicated on the technological evolution of medicine. Whereas in fact, you know, well, 95, 90, 95 percent of our, our health is actually what we eat and what we do, how we conduct ourselves. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right about that. And I, that's why I find the most fascinating thing, this stark contrast between excess mortality. That's as basic an indicator as you can get. And, and the fact that uh, when the COVID was rampaging around, there was ultimately no increase in excess mortality because it targeted basically the very old. Then we switch things up. We come up with these vaccines and we insist on doing something that's never been done before, where we say basically everybody on the planet has to get this stuff uh, injected into their arm, including people who are at no risk whatsoever, such as uh, people in young middle age, uh, in, in the flower of youth, or even uh, primary school children. So we insist that all of those people have to get jabbed with this stuff. And there is a discernible uptick in excess mortality, and yet we're not permitted to talk about it. Absolutely. Uh, it's, you, you can't go there. You can't talk about it whatsoever. Mm. And uh, th that is being curated by governments and uh, being suppressed by media. And, uh, and it's not a rational argument. I think one thing we have to realize, Mark, is that we're not involved in a rational argument here. It, it's uh, it's not a question of sitting down with someone and saying, let's look at the science, because I was in a position at, at the start here of corresponding with people who were advising the government. And when I started to uh, raise some doubts and say, oh, well, look, these side effects don't look good, then the conversation finished. Mm -hmm. it, it was a point of faith mm -hmm that uh, the vaccine was a standalone uh, solution. And this has been a, a point of faith in an increasingly uh, kind of commercially orientated medical system, that vaccination is right. the standalone solution. Whereas in fact, the, the central underpinning factors of health are what we eat, how we exercise, how well we sleep, how well we you know, conduct ourselves so we enjoy and we're mm. not stressed. These are the real factors yeah. of health. I, I, I suggested right from the start here that, that we have to go ahead. I said to the government, we have to go ahead and have a program to help him, people improve their health habits. But that was completely yeah. rejected. Yeah. No, we're going to go with vaccination. No, and and novel vaccination. That, uh, <laughs> yeah, we. Yeah, it's a true fact. That, for example, ob obesity <laughs> is one of the one of the factors uh, that uh, one of the most serious underlying conditions. If you're forty pounds overweight or whatever, uh, that that's more that's that's more a determinant of how you're going to handle COVID than anything. But uh, what I can't understand now is why. There must be discussion of some of this at the highest levels in government. And yet governments around the world, I mean, in Canada, for example, you can't get on a train unless you've been vaccinated. So you're stuck where you are. You can't take a train from Montreal to Toronto unless you've got proof of your vaccination status. How can they still insist on that? given A, what happened with the Omicron, so we've seen it makes no difference, and B, what yeah. these, the, the disturbing questions these studies are raising. It, it's a form of hubris. hubris. They're, they're, mm. People have started to play God. I think you can see this in politics, is that your, your last mm. guest was talking about this, that people uh, really believe in themselves and their authority. Our, our whole uh, system of having stakeholders has disappeared. You know, historically, democracy had stakeholders, um, and, and it dates right mm. back to King John uh, and the Magna Carta when he had to, instead of, yeah. he had to rule with the barons instead of over them. Mm. And uh, we have had scientists, yeah. we have had people in medicine and so on. And the government has moved away from that model. They no longer have stakeholders 
uh, yeah. holders. They they play it more like a reality TV game where there's only one winner and he tells everyone he gets all the money and he tells everyone what to do. And this this kind of psychology is wrapped up with it. Plus, there's this idea that has been sold to everyone that biotechnology is going to cure every disease. And this is the big lie. If yeah, you look yeah. at the research, it's highly mutagenic. Yeah. It, it's uh, the gene yep, therapy no. that has been used over the last 30 years. It's not working. No, uh, that's a very good point, and uh, it's good of you to remind us of Magna Carta. We need to get some of these guys into a big boggy field off the River Thames and uh, do that to them all over again. Thank you very much, Guy. We're going to stay on this, and we will watch. Uh, we will read what you write, and we will watch for other studies from Germany and Poland and such places. Coming up, we're going to stump the Stein. GB Views at GBNews.UK plus. How's that war going? Don't go anywhere. We're coming right back. GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you ask. So why not add your voice to the conversation in the comments section? Don't forget to subscribe. We are GB News, Britain's news channel. Every night at 11 on GB News, we bring you the next day's stories the day before. Basically like time travel. If it's a big story, we'll cover it, guaranteed. But we'll also have some fun along the way. Big opinions, big laughs. Sometimes big hair. This is Headliners, Headliners the paper review show that won't send you to sleep like the others will. 11 p.m., seven nights a week. Join us. Hello there, I'm Eamon Holmes. And I'm Isabel Webster. And we hope you can join us for... Breakfast with Eamon. And Isabel. You make me laugh out loud, belly laugh. Is that important first thing in the morning? Yeah, absolutely. And there's me trying to be deadly serious. <laughs> News is a serious business. Yeah, I have to rein you in sometimes. Well, it doesn't stop us laughing at it. It doesn't stop us having an opinion on what's going on. Yeah. And it certainly will not stop us reflecting what you think. Weekdays from six to half past nine on GB News. I'm Dan Wooten. Join me Monday to Thursday from 9 to 11 for the feistiest and most fun news debate on TV where free speech reigns. I'll bring you a sharp take on the day's biggest stories, bombshell newsmaker interviews and A-list guests. And I guarantee you no spin, no bias, no censorship and no reason to go to bed. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursdays from 9 on GB News. Coming up on Dan Wooten tonight. With the cost of living crisis threatening to put the squeeze on Brits and become a major headache for the Tories, I'll bring you all the best analysis of a critical spring statement for Rishi Sunak. Among the big name politicians and expert commentators joining me, former Chancellor Lord Ken Clark, former Business Secretary Andrea Leadsom, political firebrand Anne Whittacombe, and the irrepressible Rod Little. Plus, making his debut on my superstar panel, one of the most celebrated British political journalists of our time, John Sargent, who'll be joined by star Daily Mail columnist Amanda Patel and political commentator Daisy McAndrew. That's Dan Wooten tonight, Monday to Thursday from 9pm till 11pm on GB News. A couple of days ago, heading west, I ran into a couple of Ukrainians heading back east to Kiev and Kharkiv, which uh, struck me as odd, but they'd concluded that the tide had already turned and they were eager to get back home. There's evidence to support that. The Ukrainians claim to have retaken ground captured by the Russians. Uh, the blue and yellow flag flies again in Makarif, west of Kiev, and in the south at Voznesensk. Russian deaths are estimated at the end of this first month. 
at just under 14,000, or about what it took them a decade to lose in Afghanistan. If you add in the injured, close to a third of their invasion force is already out of commission. Uh, I can't uh, play the whole thing because the language is a bit robust, but an intercepted phone call between two Russian soldiers shows they're not too chuffed with the way things are going. Как и всегда, я говорю, сука, даже в Чечне в свое время такого не было. Намного было, и хоть ясно было. Тут такой трейлер. Я говорю, на нас свой самолет по авиабомбы скинул. Ну, это нормально. А сирена, ебать. С добрым утром было, блядь. Не знаю, это, блядь. Дурдом, нахер. Это все что-то... Yeah, they uh, describe it as a bleep storm, a bleep storm. Uh, Sean Raymond is an ex-para and he's covered wars all over the map. Let's let's try and actually uh, look at this in fairly basic military terms. The thing has been this first month, at the end of this first month, Putin is basically looking at various forms of defeat as his as his options would you say yeah um by the way thanks for having me on it's um it's mm. it's not looking what good at all for putin uh, or for the russian army um the uh, the losses are huge uh far greater than i think that he uh thought he was going to um predict um but, but then saying that it's very very difficult to know what the Russian generals were predicting. You know, uh, your bleep storm mm. um, that you mentioned earlier just about sums it up. Mm. Well, you you have in uh, have written about some of in the Spectator about not just the men but the amazing amount of material he's lost. Uh, 1,500 tanks, 1,500 armored vehicles. I mean, it's not just that the men are unmotivated. But it's also that the hardware has failed to perform in a certain sense. Yeah, I think that um, I mean there's 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 lots of unknowns in what's going on with the Russian army. If mm. you look at the size of their defence budget, it's about sixty billion a year. That's what it was last year, around about sixty billion. But it's mm. on paper, it is absolutely vast. You know, I think that they've got something like twelve thousand tanks on paper. In the British Army, we've got something like 250 off the top of my head. Um, our defence budget is 30 billion, so it's half of what theirs is. But the amount of equipment they've got, which has to be looked after, which has to be serviced, which has to be properly equipped, is is huge. And you, it, that amount of money, 60 billion, just doesn't go that far when you're talking about having maybe 900,000 men under arms, uh, maybe 100 mm. warships you know, dozens of submarines, thousands mm. of fighter aircraft. So it's not surprising that um, things have gone so badly wrong. Uh, the, the planning just seems to be appalling. Um, not that I've got any great insight, but if you if you look at what's happened, um, that tr vehicles have run out of fuel, they've run out of ammunition, the soldiers have, the, you know, it's clear that they don't want to fight, their morale is low. Just about everything that can go wrong has gone wrong. And you just wonder what their planning assumptions were at the beginning of all of this. I mean, we're sort of told that, that um, Putin expected Ukraine to just give up and that he would be, his troops would be welcomed in as heroes. And, and that clearly hasn't happened. But in, in any planning you do, you know, whether you're going to go on holiday or whether you're going to start a war, you always tend to think about what, what, what might go wrong. You know, and and in and if you're going mm. to invade a country, and your pl your your planning assumption is that that your enemy might not fight, surely there's a question: What are we going to do if they do fight? And that just doesn't seem to have been asked yeah. by the Russian generals. And it's actually a, a little bit beyond that, I think, because aside from the performance of the Ukrainian armed forces. 
You also have this thing which is visible wherever you go in the country is that uh, a, a lot of the civilian population has been deputized to go and unscrew the street <coughs> signs. So for example, they don't even know what town uh, they're driving through or whether this town is the town that leads them to Kiev or wherever they're trying to go. So these are, these are like basically old school forms of sabotage and the Russians just are walking into these traps and being redirected by uh, f supposedly friendly villages, villages into the middle of nowhere. I mean, th things like that you would have thought the Kremlin of all places would have anticipated. Yeah, it is interesting. I mean, one of the things which has been sticking sort of at the back of my mind, which, which I couldn't really get into in the piece in The Spectator today, but si simply because there wasn't room, which is why are intelligence services didn't didn't know this you know uh, the, the assumption has been that russia the russian military is a superpower it's something that we ought to be scared of and w when i asked general danit this he said we've given them too much credit but but why have we given them too much credit where was the you know where was the intelligence gathering what were mi5 doing what were mi6 doing what was defense intelligence doing mm. surely that they must have seen that that the russian military just weren't up to scratch you know they've been having mm. exercises on the Ukrainian border for, for months and months and months. I, mean, I you know, I don't no idea what they were doing. But they I think when you look at that and you look at the lack of initiative which also exists within in in the Russian military. So si simply everybody does does what they're told, which is completely different to, you know, the, the British mm. army. The British you know, every soldiers obey orders but they they have their own views and if they see something going wrong then they're going mm. to say you know let's not do that let's do this you know and that's something which is sort of that's a culture which exists all the way up yeah 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 i i what do, what does it mean in the end for uh putin's options now because He's a guy, basically his whole shtick is that he's a winner and he's a tough guy. And that's why he has fans in the West, because they look at him riding around bare chested on horseback and they think he's, he's the strong man on a horse. Well, when he's actually commanding his troops into another country and suddenly the strong man on a horse looks like the big loser chump, what, what does he do now to preserve his own rule and to try and salvage what he can get out of this? Well, it's a, you know, that's a very, very good question. I think that in terms of uh, what's going on in Ukraine, he's stuck. Um, there's, uh, mm. The leader of Britain's armed forces in 2001, uh, Admiral Sir Mike Boyce, who was then the uh, chief of defence staff, warned uh, uh british troops are about to go in that it into afghanistan back then that it was it's much easier to um start a war than to end one and i think that's exactly what putin's position is now he thought he was going to be able to go in he thought he was going to be able to roll up the ukrainian armed forces pretty quickly he thought the ukrainian um uh population would just um come under Kremlin, the Kremlin's heel, and that just hasn't happened. So what does he do next? What are his options? Well, he could um, flatten um, Mariupol in the south and have a, a, a sort of a land corridor which links um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the peninsula there to uh, up to Russia, which is, is, is something that, that, that he might settle for. Um, but he's stuck, you know. He's not going to be able to withdraw from Ukraine with his credibility intact. Um, what yeah. that means, well, you know, will his generals want to carry on fighting? Will they want to see their losses growing? Um, you know, they've, they, they, I saw, you know, he, he's lost more soldiers than the Americans lost on Iwo Jima. You know, the, you look at Afghanistan mm. and, and the fiasco of the Afghan war for the Russians helped bring about, you know, the collapse of the uh, of the Soviet Union. He's already already round in that ballpark of losing that many troops already. So, you know, it's an absolute disaster mm. for him. It's but the big question is, what does he do next? How does he get out of this? He doesn't, on the face of it, look as though he is in any mood to uh, negotiate with the Ukrainians. 
Yeah, it's very, it's very interesting to me. It may it totally change our whole conception. As you say, it's extraordinary that the CIA and MI6 didn't have a more accurate evaluation of the competence of the Russian military. It certainly says, it says a lot about a lot of things, including our own intelligence uh, services. Uh, thank you uh, for that analysis. And the piece is in The Spectator, and we encourage people to go and read it, because these are sobering times. And if I were Vladimir Putin, I wouldn't like to think about where we're going to be in another month's time. In our Closing moments. Thank you, Sean. In our closing moments, let's get to some of your questions. George says, um, the Russian military move on Chinese-made tires. Those tires are of pretty poor quality and are at least one of the many problems Putin is having to deal with. In a conflict, the Chinese would also be moving on those same tires. From what I've read, the Russian forces are mostly inexperienced troops. None of the Chinese military, despite impressive hardware, have much in the way of experience. They have not done well against Indian or Vietnamese troops. Uh, that's certainly true with the Indian situation, which I've, uh, I, I've followed uh, closely. The Indian troops, man for man, perform much better than the Chinese. Uh, Russia versus Ukraine was going to be a flower-strewn cakewalk, except it isn't. If I'm Xi, I would begin to wonder if China versus Taiwan wouldn't be something similar. The most important factor, George, in any kind of war is always will, and the Ukrainians certainly seem to have that. Um, Mark says, can you define woman? Oh, my God. How did this get through? This is a trick question. He's trying to, he's trying to tick trick me into saying that a woman is, has got a cervix, whatever the hell that. I wouldn't know a cervix if it f fell on my head. Uh, I'm like uh, Sir Keir Starmer. I like a woman who uh, has got a nice, curvaceous, body, feminine, perfumed hair and uh, hung like a stallion. That's the new kind of woman. Sir Keir Starmer and me are all about that kind of uh, woman. Jersey says, who do you think is behind the obviously systematic attempts to destroy our society by infiltrating all our institutions? I think that we have absolutely pervert this whole business with the Duke and Duchess of Cambridge. No Jamaican prime minister would have said that to them 50 years ago. We've, we've, had a com we've been taught to loathe our civilizational inheritance. That'll do it. Dan Wooden is here to give it some Wednesday welly for two walloping hours. Stay safe, stay free. Hello, I'm Alex Deakin with your latest weather update from the Met Office. Dry and sunny conditions likely to persist for the next several days. Warm by day and still the nights are long enough for things to turn a little chilly. Certainly overnight tonight under largely clear skies it's going to be turning quite fresh. High pressure is dominating however and this one is moving back in towards the UK to bring plenty more fine weather even into the weekend. There is a weak weather front drifting near northern Scotland bringing a bit of thicker clouds to Shetland and the cloud will increase overnight for the north of Northern Ireland to western parts of Scotland. Maybe a shower or two in here as well but otherwise dry, clear and turning quite cold. Towns and cities down to one or two Two degrees there will be a frost in rural spots chilly start then to Thursday could be some fog around as well most likely over northeast England uh, down towards Lincolnshire maybe East Anglia but that should be gone by mid-morning it will be a cloudier day for Western Scotland and Northern Ireland but even here it's mostly dry and bright it's just one or two isolated showers again over Northern England northeast Scotland in the sunshine temperatures jumping up after that chilly start 16 17 widely 18, 19, possibly 20 Celsius in one or two places. So pretty warm for the time of year. Any of those isolated showers over northern England, northeast Scotland fading away during the evening. So again, it's a, a largely clear night with light winds. So it will be turning cold once more. A chilly start to Friday, but another cracking day if you like spring sunshine. Again, some early morning mist and fog. And the, Coast of Northern Ireland may be a bit misty and murky at times during Friday, but um, again, by the odd, very isolated shower. It's dry, it's fine, with sunny spells and temperatures well above average. A weather front will bring some cloud and patchy rain to Shetland during Friday, just 9 or 10 here, but otherwise we're looking at temperatures widely in the mid to high teens once more. As that high pressure sticks around into the weekend, we can expect more sunny skies. Goodbye.
GB News is the UK's home of discussion and debate from all perspectives. To stay up to date on the latest stories, make sure that you subscribe to the GB News channel right here on YouTube. You can watch us live 24-7 across the whole world. You can also check out exclusive content and catch up on previous episodes of your favourite shows. Every day, we ask the questions that you dare. So why not add 